want to welcome you to tonight's uh, prayer meeting. Um, we will be praying, but our focus will be on the man of God called Elijah, especially on the the later part of his ministry. We will be looking at his life and using his experience to pray for ourselves. My prayer is that this race that we are on, we shall finish strong in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now, um, 1 Kings 19, from verse 1, uh, reads, He have told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the God do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he, that is Elijah, was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. When you look at this particular passage, it's like a dream happening, especially when you consider the previous events that have preceded this particular period. As far as Elijah was concerned, it was the probably still the day, not even the morning before, after the day, the, the, the day after, or why the morning of the day after. It was probably still the evening of that day when God had just wrought a mighty miracle by the hands of Elijah. In a space of a few hours, God performed three mighty miracles. The first one was that God sent down fire from heaven to consume the um, sacrifice that had been placed. You know, the wager was the God that answered by fire is God. Mm. Elijah's God answered by fire. Mm. And everybody said, yes, he is God. That was the first miracle. And of course, because God showed himself to be God, according to the law, all false prophets or false, or false gods were to be killed. So that was exactly what Elijah did. Elijah gathered the people. They killed 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Ashtaroth. So that's 850 false prophets that were killed that day. The second miracle was that Elijah now went for, further up to the mountain in Camel and he started praying, Father, cause your rain to fall. Now that the cause has been removed, Lord, remove the effect of the cause. And what happened? After praying for God knows how many hours, Elijah was able to see the sign of rain. He saw cloud like the shape of a hand, and he knew, oh yes. And he also heard it. He said, I hear the abundance of rain. So Elijah knew that rain was coming. But before the rain came, Elijah went and warned King Kehab, who was present at the moment, came out that room. Mr. Man, you better quickly get on your on your chariot and run, because if you don't, this rain will beat you, and you're going to get cold. So, 
Ahab gathered himself and quickly hastened to go to Jezreel. But the second miracle of the day was that after delivering that message to Ahab, Elijah himself gathered himself and ran to Jezreel, the same city. He did not eat a ride with Ahab, but he ran in the power of God and he outran the best horses in the land. And he outran a chariot and got into Jezreel before Ahab did. That was the second miracle. And by the time he got there, the rain that had not fallen for three and a half years by the word of Elijah started falling. So it was the height of Elijah's ministry. It's at a point in time when it is like, when you have that kind of confirmation of your ministry and relationship with God, oh, you feel like exalted is the best place to be. And Elijah had three of it in one day. Then a few hours later, after Ahab had told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets, Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the God do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of the one of them by this time tomorrow. Now, what gave Jezebel the temerity to threaten the life of the man of God? And more importantly, why did Elijah become afraid? Somebody who had just experienced the greatness of God, like no man has, suddenly is running away because a woman threatened them. Could Elijah had responded differently? Certainly. Number one, he could have been not afraid. That's just it. He could have chosen not to be afraid. But sometimes, when you look at what's going on, you can adduce different reasons as to why Elijah behaved the way he was. You can say that maybe he was tired. Or you can say that he felt the pressure. But whatever it was, Elijah, he reacted in a way that he, he wouldn't have under normal circumstances. He knew what Jezebel was able to do. But at this point in time, he overreacted. She said then he was afraid. And he rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba. Elijah ran for his life. Why did he run? Was it because God was no longer able to protect him? We know that's not the issue. He did not even ask God, Lord, look at this woman threatening me. Remember the story of the disciples when the, the authorities, when they threatened them, I said, look, you are not to preach in the name of this Jesus again. What did they say? They prayed and said, Lord God, look on their threats. So they had the right attitude that when we are threatened, we should look up to God. Now this brings to four another truth that whenever you have a victory, a spiritual victory, always be prepared for a counter-attack. Whenever God gives you victory over the devil, 
get ready for a counter attack. Elijah was not ready for this attack. That was why it caught him by surprise. That was why he was afraid. Maybe you might have experienced it in your own life. That when you had one kind of a breakthrough, suddenly there was a blowback, a demonic blowback. And you're wondering, ah, what's going on? It's because when you've had a breakthrough, that is a time when you are most vulnerable. It's a time that you are not expecting any attack from the enemy. It's a time it's like when your guards are down. Why? Because you are still rejoicing in the goodness of the Lord. And then the enemy gives you a counter punch. And you wonder, you find yourself on the floor, wonder, how did I get here? From the top, right to the ground. It is because of a principle, a spiritual principle, that when you are high, be very careful. Because you may just be on the ground before you know it. So keep that in mind. Whenever you are rejoicing, keep one eye around because the enemy might want to hit back and eat you where you are not expecting. That is a spiritual principle. So, Elijah, the main problem that Elijah had was the problem of attitude. When he was unexpected, uh, unexpectedly eat by the devil, he did not even bother to fight back. Why? Could it be that maybe because it was, you can't say it was spiritually weak, but you can say that maybe he was spiritually depleted. Because look at all that happened in the day. The fire that came from heaven. You know, he allowed the, the people of Baal to do their own thing. And he didn't stop, he didn't step in until early evenings. So for hours, those people were doing their own thing and Elijah was watching. And then after he called down the fire, he now had to go further and he prayed for a few more hours. And then after that, he now ran from where he was to Jezreel. Who knows how long it would have taken him to get there. So by the time the servants or the messenger of Jezebel came, he was tired. And tiredness can bring discouragement. Physical tiredness can make you to become discouraged. Spiritual tiredness can make you become discouraged. Mm. You know, one of his complaints, he said to God, Lord, I've had enough. Mm. I've had enough. Mm. So what does that tell us? Mm. As much as possible. Rest whenever you can. Mm. Why? Because you need to conserve your strength. You don't know what's around the corner. When you celebrate victories, don't celebrate it too much. Thank God, enjoy that present time, but not too much. And get ready for the next one, for the next battle. Rest if you can and when you must. But understand that the war is not over. It's just one battle. Now, in verse 4, it says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. <laughs> and he came and sat down under a broom tree. At this point in time, Elijah was discouraged, not just that, he was depressed. When you are depressed, depressed, more often than not, you want to be by yourself. You don't like company. No, like they say, 
Israel loves her. What do you call it? Yeah. 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 So it's like he, he, in his own case, he, he, when you are depressed, you just don't want to be by yourself. So what we see here is a prophet in crisis. And, and, he, and he asked that he might die. He asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O oh Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Those are the kind of words somebody who's in a deep depression speaks. <laughs> somebody who desires death rather than face life. He's saying, Look, it is enough. I have had enough. At that moment in time, Elijah had, he had lost the will to live. See, all that is going on is a demonic attack. But Elijah was not resisting. See, Jezebel did not just speak ordinary words. Jezebel spoke by the spirit of the devil that was in her. And it was that spirit that upended Elijah. <laughs> and what that tells us that even the most anointed of God can become vulnerable to demonic spirits or demonic attacks. And maybe that's why men of God usually pray, ask, ah, pray for us, pray for us. Why? Because, you know, the Bible says two are better than one because they will get a good reward for their labor. A tree cut strand is not easily broken. Maybe if somebody had been praying for Elijah, maybe he would have stood. We don't know. But what we do know is that he fell into a hole that it was difficult for him to get out of. In verse 5, it says, And he lay down and he slept under a broom tree. That is a pure sign of depression. Somebody who is depressed, they just want to sleep all day. They will sleep all night. They just want to sleep and sleep. So Elijah was depressed. And when you are sleeping, you are not working. When you are sleeping, your mind is not actively fighting. You are not being productive. So, Elijah had down tools. But even in his state, God had not left him. The Bible says, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate, and he drank, and lay down again. Okay. You know, this was not the first time that Elijah would be by himself. After he had prophesied, there shall be no rain for three and a half years. Mm. He went and eat himself. And you know what happened there? That God commanded ravens to feed him. And he drank the water by the brook charity. No, this time God did not command any raven. God sent an angel to come and feed Elijah. And you know what that tells us? Is that God cares for us. Mm. That even when we are down, it, it doesn't mean that we are out. It simply means that we need to rest. We need to be fed from, from heaven. You can say that Elijah suffered burnout. Mm. Burnout is something that we are all prone to suffering from, especially in the, the frenetic way lifestyle that we all lead. It's something that happens to everybody, it can, can happen to anybody. When you don't take enough rest, when you don't take, spend enough time with God, or when it's like 
you you're just too tired and you're unable to resist the attack of the enemy by yourself mm. you just give up and say okay god that's it i'm no longer a pastor god cared for him god provisioned him there and then he didn't have to cook the food god cooked it for him he did not even have to fetch the water god provided him water there and he ate and he drank and he lay down again mm. why because even though god tried to encourage him elijah was too far down to be able to get up and go so he slept again verse 7 and the angel of the lord came again a second time and touched him and said arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. At this point in time, God has started revealing his plan to Elijah. First, he fed him. Then he fed him again. He needed to be fed well because of the plan that God had for him. Mm. Verse 8, and it says, And he arose, and he ate, and he drank. Mm. And he went in the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. Just two meals that lasted in 40 days. Mm. You know, if you, are, if you eat today, that food might last you a few days, but that some time is gone. Whatever, whether, whatever it's, 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 you have to revert or resort to whatever it is that you've stored in your body. Hmm. But in Elijah's case, you know, it is one thing to eat food and be fasting and stay in one place and not exert yourself. You know, it's another thing to be fasting and be doing strenuous work. When Elijah was traveling, he was not traveling on a, on a chariot, he was walking. He walked for 40 days and 40 nights on the strength of the food he had eaten. And we don't even know whether he drank water. Because God fed him supernaturally. It is only supernatural ability that, that enables you to go in the strength of one or two meals for 40 days or to not drink for 40 days. Now, the Bible did not specify whether he did not eat or he did not, he did not drink for 40, for 40 days because some might want to contend that. But going by what just that passage said, it says, and he arose and he ate and he drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights so maybe he drank since he didn't say in the strength of that food and water maybe he drank on the way but you know it's not an easy thing not to eat for 40 days it's nearly impossible in natural to travel for 40 days without eating it is very very difficult people usually fall down and die by the wayside that's how some some people, some souls, some armies, they call it the death match. When they, a way of eliminating their prisoners of war that they want to kill, they will just tell them, okay, we are going from here to here. And people, and they will start walking and walking. Whoever, those who fall down, they will kill them. And some, they will just walk them to death like that. It did not, that was, it wasn't the case with Elijah. So we can see here that even when his servants, they are not at their best, God does not turn his back on us. He fills us supernaturally. But we see here that despite all that God was doing for Elijah, nothing seemed to change. 
God encouraged Elijah. He refused to be encouraged. Every time that God wanted to lift him up, Elijah would go back down. He was a man of God who had given up on God. All he wanted to do was just die. Elijah walked in the strength of that food for 40 days and he came, he arrived at Horeb. And then God spoke to him. You know what God asked him? He says, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? He says, in verse and he came to the cave and lodged him. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? You know, I remember years ago when I too I was depressed. It was a one a few hours depression, let me call it that way. But it was something in the making for a few days. I just looked at myself and I realized, ah, David, you are walking. You can't clothe yourself. You can't feed yourself. You can't even house yourself. What I what, what was life what was life really about? And I became depressed. And it was Sunday. And you see, at that time, every Sunday, we were the first to go to church because we opened the church. We get everything ready for service. And the brothers I was living with said, Ah, oh, brother David, let's go to church. I said, No worry, I'll meet you there later. Here I was at home on the bed, wallowing in pity. What kind of life is this? I mean, I've lived this. I mean, I've walked for God. I've done it. It's like there's no blessing. It's like I was. After some time, after everybody had left, you know what God asked me? The same question he asked Elijah. David, what are you doing here? You are supposed to be somewhere else at this time. What are you doing here? Maybe God had plans for Elijah to be fighting the forces of the demons of Jezebel spiritually in Jezreel. But because Elijah had let himself go, he was depressed. He was now in the wrong place at the right time. What are you doing here? How did you get here? How did you get to this point? You know, when God asked me that same question, I, I looked at myself. I said, oh my God, how did I get here? I knew immediately. I took my eyes off God and I started looking at my circumstances. I knew that when my eyes were on God, even without trying to, you see me smiling in my face. Why? Because I was just so much into God that you can see that joy. The moment I realized my mistake, I quickly put on my clothes and I went to church. But you can see it on my face. I could remember the master calling me and said, ah, David, is everything all right? Oh, he said, yeah, I'm not just feeling too well. Why? Because it was not just me. I was always the smiling guy. Why? Because, because I knew God was taking care of me. God was in control. But that moment, I, I, I lost my joy. And it was apparent for everybody to see. Because the smile, the joy that others associated with me was, no longer, was not there. I was depressed. But, you know, I made a promise to God. I said, Lord, before I left that room that day, I said, Lord, if you were to get me out of this thing, I would never again be depressed in my life. I told God that. Because now that I knew the secret of not getting depressed, I was determined that I would never be depressed again. It's been nearly 30 years since then. And I've been through more difficult times since then. But you know what? 
I have never been depressed. Why? Because I had learned to keep my eyes on God. God did everything possible for Elijah to enable him to keep his eyes where it mattered. But every time God did it, Elijah still refused. God asked him, what are you doing here? What did he say? He said, in verse 10, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. Verse 10. He says, jealous in my own passion. I'm, I'm using the ESV. So you can say he's jealous as well. I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. At this point in time, God still tried to demonstrate his power so as to remind Elijah of the God that he was dealing with. Verse 11, and he said, that is God said to Elijah, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. The Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. You know, all that firework that God was doing was to remind Elijah of the God that he served. But it didn't seem to work. Verse 13. And when Elijah had it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Brethren, let me submit to you. A Christian who is depressed is on a strange territory. You cannot be depressed and have your eyes on God at the same time. God will have to ask you, how did you get here? What are you doing here? That is not your place. Depression territory is not your lot. It's, it's where the joy of the Lord becomes your strength. That is your lot. Verse 14, he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord. He was he kept repeating the same thing. Nothing changed the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even only I, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. At this point in time, God has said, okay, all right, I've had enough. You know, the prayer you're going to pray tonight is, Lord, don't you ever, Lord God, give up on me. God gave up on Elijah because he knew that Elijah ought to have known better. With all that accomplished through Elijah, only a small thing caused him to fall. So what did God say? All right, since you are not willing to work with me, I will work with somebody else. Don't expect me to beg you to do my work. Verse 15, And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Azel to be king 
over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehola, you shall anoint to be the prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Israel shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elijah, Elisha put to death. Now God now said one thing. You know, at this point in time, Elijah was basking in the glow of his self-importance. He says, and I, only I am left. Even Elisha himself knew that that was a lie. You know what? Remember, Oba, is it Oba, Obadiah, the, the servant of the king, who hid hundred prophets and was feeding them from the table of Heap. So these people were still there. Yet Elijah went before God and said, I am the only one left. Okay, God said, okay, verse, okay. Yet, in the other verse, he says, I have reserved 7,000 people in Israel. All the knees that have not bowed to Baal. So it was more or less it to, to, to Elijah. <laughs> Don't think that you are the center of my universe. We get into trouble whenever we start thinking that, that we are the center of God's universe instead of God being the center of our universe. When we think that God's plan revolves around us, we are indispensable. God said, mm -mm, you can't hold me hostage. You don't want to go ahead? No problem. I've got a replacement. So another prayer we're going to pray is, Lord God, even if you have a replacement for me, may they never be called into service. Lord, even if you have a replacement for me, may that replacement, may they always be potential, but never actual. Because as long as I'm busy working for the Lord, <laughs> that replacement, you have to wait and wait and wait until I'm, God, I've, I've finished and God is done with me. May, may nobody else replace us in the plan of God in Jesus' mighty name. So, what are we praying about? Lord, this journey that I have started, I must finish strong. I must finish well. Come up in my strength and glorify your name in my life. Let us start praying. In Jesus' mighty name, we are afraid. Amen. You know what Elijah's life taught us, or to Jesus, is the fact that no one is indispensable. That the fact that you started well is no guarantee that you've finished strong. It teaches us that God is no respecter of persons. That we can't hold God hostage and say, God, ah, if you don't do this, ah, 
you won't do this. No. We must always know our place where God is concerned. As you can see, God used Elijah mightily. Like he had never used people before. But God would not be controlled by man. So we are going to pray, Lord God, help me not to become too big for my shoes. Mm. Mm. Help me, Lord God, not to think too highly of myself mm. such that I will defy you. Mm. Help me so that when I'm down and you want to lift me up, I'll be able to jump up. See, when Elijah fell, he fell so hard. And you know what? He never recovered. There was only one miracle associated with him after that day. It was the miracle of him parting the river Jordan as he was on his way to be taken up into heaven. After the moment he left God's presence, we never had again that any miracle was done in his ministry. He just faded away. We are going to pray, Lord. Don't let me fade away. Lord, let me go from glory to glory. Let me finish on a high. Let's pray. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. You know, when God asks him, Why are you? What are you doing here? And Elijah just continued to rant. Oh, this, oh, that, oh, this, oh, that. God said, Okay, you know what? This is the solution. Anoint Israel of Syria, anoint Jehu of Israel, anoint Elisha in your place. This was the solution, but Elijah was no part of it. The Bible says that God did not allow us to be tempted above what we are able, but that with ill will, with every temptation, make a way of escape. God never said that we will not go through difficulties. He never said that we will be forever shielded from demonic attacks. Because this was a demonic attack on Elijah. But the problem was his attitude. His attitude was wrong. When we have a wrong attitude, we cannot have a right response to the challenges that face us. And it was because Elijah persisted in that wrong attitude. He refused to even countenance the solution that God might have. He never asked for it. God said, all right, okay, I know you didn't ask for it, but I'm going to tell you, you're only, the, only, the only problem for you is that you won't be part of it. I'm retiring you. So we are going to pray to the Father. Even when the enemy blindsigned us, Lord, give me the presence of mind to never forget that however difficult things may be, you've always provided a way of escape. Yeah. 
and let me always seek that way of escape so that your glory can be seen in me so that i will not be a casualty so that i will not be a victim but i shall be victorious over my circumstances in jesus mighty name lord grant me the presence of mind oh lord god to be always mindful of the fact that you will never leave me you will never forsake me oh lord god help me not to be inconsolable like Elijah was, where it's like, even as you are encouraging him, he even sent an angel to feed him. He still refused. You gave him strength to go in 40 days. He still refused. You showed your power. You showed your mind before him. He still refused. Oh, Lord God, don't let me get to that point. Where it's like you have to try and try and try. me. Help me, oh, Lord God. So that my eyes are always focused on you, regardless of circumstances, in Jesus' mighty name. Let us pray. Oh, In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. You know, when Jezebel spoke, our words were not ordinary. They were the words of principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. And when those words, when they eat Elijah, it was like a 10-ton truck. It flood Elijah totally. It flooded him. He took to his heels. He ran away. And his life was never the same again. He could not think straight anymore. You know, when there are different kinds of attacks, some attacks will eat us for six. It, they will knock our reasoning out. We just, we, we lose any sign of cognition, any sign of control. This was the kind of attack that was upon Elijah. You know, there are different kinds of attacks. Elijah, in this case, was a man of God. He was flowing in the power of God. Yet when this attack came, it, it knocked him down. What does that tell us? Nobody is beyond being attacked by the enemy. Also, that some attacks are different from some attacks. There are some attacks that will eat us and we're able to take it and withstand. But some, when they eat us, we, we, just, we just find ourselves on the floor and struggling to come up. But what God expects is that whatever the magnitude of the attack, that we never take our eyes off him. Why? Because he is the Lord of hosts. Elijah became discouraged. He became despondent. And he took himself out of the, out of the game. I want you to pray for yourself that any kind of attack that will take me out of the game, that will make me irrelevant, 
Oh Lord God, let it not succeed against me. You know, when I'm not talking about ordinary spiritual attacks. I'm talking about extraordinary spiritual attacks. Those are the kinds of attacks that will take a great man of God and plump him down and he's never able to rise up again. Father, whatever the magnitude of the attack, show yourself strong on my behalf. Father, Lord God, when I am unable to pray, when I'm unable to resist, Lord God, deliver me. Let us pray. Oh, <laughs> E carabato so kushkiri he, me carabato kata sanish ke pur kaba, mo mo kur kata sanish he, he ta kaba shengere ba kaba, mo koto so lo ko shengere ba ha, oh ma ba 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 ra ba lo ko somo she he, he ta carabato no she karaba, lo ko to so lo kushkiri he, he ma ta no shengere ba kaba kuri kaba, ha shengere mo lo so kushkiri he, la to kushkiri sakaba, he mo lo kata sanish ke pur kaba, oh ma kaba shengere mo to so lo kushkiri sakaba, la to koto so in Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. Our last prayer will be Lord God. Let me finish strong. Mm. Let me finish strong. Mm. Let me finish well. Let me finish well. Lord, your promise is that mm. though your beginning is small, mm. your latter end shall be great indeed. Mm. Father, don't let my best years be in my past. Mm. Let my latter hand outshine my beginning. Father, mm. you are a merciful God. Yes. Whatever the enemy has tried or has planned mm. to use to take me out, mm. Lord, destroy his contraption. Amen. Father, don't let my testimony turn into a lament. Don't let me be somebody who be an has been. Mm. We're walking with you is concerned. Mm. Don't let me become careless. Mm. Don't let me become so euphoric mm. that I lose sight that the battle is won, but the war is still on. Yes, sir. <laughs> Father, give me a stout heart, a heart that is able to take and withstand the press of the enemy. Amen. And is able to speak and fire back Amen. like David did. You know, when David faced Goliath, mm. those two guys, they understood what the others did not know. Mm. That they were conducting spiritual warfare. The Bible says that Goliath cursed David by his gods. And David responded, you come with me with sword and spear. I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Those guys we are talking in the spiritual realm. Our battles are first fought and won in the spiritual realm before they manifest in the physical. 
So when the enemy tries to intimidate me, Father Lord, prepare, get ready within me, oh Lord God, keep me so hot that I'm able to fire back. Can you just imagine when Jezebel sent the messenger, by this time to tomorrow, you are dead. And Elijah said, if the Lord has called me, you won't even survive the night. What do you think would have happened? God would have gone and fought and Jezebel would have died that night. Mm. Remember, it was this same Elijah who when the king sent 50 soldiers and the leader, go and arrest him and bring him here. And he would say, ah, man of God, come down. And Elijah said, if I am indeed a man of God, let fire fall down from heaven. Where was that Elijah? That the ordinary woman, even though he is like influenced by principalities, will now say, by this time tomorrow you'll be dead. And Elijah ran. Oh, Father, Lord God, let me not come down from the pedestal in which you have placed me. Father, Lord God, cause me to rise higher and higher and higher to your glory. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, <laughs> in Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Hallelujah. Mm. Amen. Father, Lord God. Yes. Elijah's story wow. simply yeah. teaches us that darkness surpasses darkness. Yes. Mm. But Lord God, that however dark the darkness may be, mm. light will always shine. Mm. Hmm. Lord, Christ. whatever the depth or the shade of darkness hmm. that your people are experiencing or going through tonight, Father, let your light shine. Amen. The Bible says that in the light was in darkness. Hmm. And the darkness does not overwhelm it. Mm. Lord, as many of your people as are feeling overwhelmed by circumstances, mm. let your light of hope flicker into life. Amen. And then, then, Lord God, let that light start expanding. Hallelujah. Until it becomes a conflagration. Amen. That will outshine the sun in Amen. their lives as your glory descends in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Lord, as we have started well, mm. don't let us end with a whimper. Elijah traveled at the heights. Ah, oh, hallelujah. But he finished in the drags. Lord, help us to mend our ways. Mm.
to make the necessary corrections that you require of us. Mm. To see and appreciate your love for us. Mm. So that we always have hope in us. To not give up. To not burn out. To rest in you. To take your strength upon ourselves. So that we can soar like it goes. Then we'll be sure to finish well and to finish strong and to glorify your name. Lord, you are the lifter of our heads. Lift our heads high. Keep us high. Help us, Lord God, to experience the reality of being seated with you in the heavenly places far above principalities and powers and do wonderful and great things in us so that we can do that greater work that you have promised us to the glory of your name. Amen. Thank you, Lord God, because you've answered our prayers, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For in Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. 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 Let's share the grace in fellowship. The grace. With the grace Amen. of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. The, the love, love of God, God and, the and the sweet fellowship of, of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Surely Amen. your goodness Amen. and mercy Amen. shall follow us all the days of our lives, Amen. and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Amen. The Lord keep you. Amen. The Lord make his face shine upon you Amen. and be gracious unto you. Amen. For in Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. God bless Thank you. you Lord.